Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week. We once again have a bunch of stuff to cover, from a fiery Delta IV heavy launch, a pair of successful Starlink missions, NASA achieved a key milestone for its SLS rocket, we have a whole load of Starship updates, and much, much, much more. Let's get right into things. With each passing week, Starbase remains a bustling hub of activity, and last week was no different. And we had some big news from Elon Musk regarding the next orbital flight test and how it's going to differ from the first one in dramatic fashion. SpaceX plans to implement a hot staging approach for stage separation on Starship. This means that instead of shutting down the engines on the lower stage before separation, the upper stage will ignite its engines while still attached to the Super Heavy, which will supposedly increase payload performance by approximately 10%. This technique will require modifications to the Super Heavy booster, including Booster 11, which involves the addition of an extension with vents and additional shielding. Elon mentioned numerous other changes to the vehicle and ongoing upgrades to the launch pad, aiming for launch readiness in approximately six weeks, which is what he said eight weeks ago. So let's not get too excited about any specific timeframes that Elon commits to here. He's hoping it is soon though. There's been some speculation that this structure is the potential extension that would need to be added, but this is unlikely to be the case because it doesn't really look like it would be structurally up to the task with that many holes in it. The Space Engineer posted an excellent Twitter thread on their theory on the Starship hot staging, using existing hardware that's currently on site. On the 6th of January, this ring was spotted outside of Tent 2, where it sat for a while before eventually being scrapped. However, another one was spotted late in May that was eventually integrated with an E-Dome. Here it is rendered by Space Engineer. It's clearly very sturdy. Those holes in the side could well be vent ports, and we can see how it would easily be integrated with a Super Heavy. The Titan II rocket used hot staging, and we can see a suspiciously similar looking vent ring at the connection between the first and second stages. What are your thoughts on hot staging? For me, it certainly seems interesting, <laughs> given that SpaceX will be wanting to reuse the Super Heavy. It's going to need a heck of a lot of shielding to protect it from those Raptor engines. Big thanks to the Space Engineer for putting together their excellent analysis as well. Be sure to give them a follow on Twitter, the link is in the description. Now, we all know and love Lab Padre, and occasionally their cameras capture some funny and human moments at Starbase. Here's a great clip of one worker throwing something to another worker, but oh. Looks like uh, he lost it. I really hope that wasn't his wallet, but hey, if it was, then I would recommend replacing it with a wallet from Exta, the inventors of the first trackable wallet and sponsor of today's video. Let me tell you why Exta is revolutionizing the way we carry our essentials. Exta creates sustainable wallets, bags, and accessories that help you get more out of every day. Their wallets are not only super slim and stylish, but they also offer quick card access with their signature trigger mechanism. But that's not all, Exeter's wallets are packed with amazing features. With built-in RFID blocking, Exeter wallets protect you from data theft and wireless skimming. Plus, they're made from environmentally friendly materials like vegan Italian leather and space grade aluminium, so you're supporting a sustainable product. And here's a really cool product, Exeter's solar powered tracking device, which lets you track your wallet's location from your phone. Just two hours of sunlight gives you three months of charge, so no need to worry about the battery either. I've partnered with Exeter today to bring you an exclusive discount. By using my code or following the link in the description, you can enjoy up to 25% off your Exeter purchase. Don't miss out on this amazing opportunity to upgrade your everyday carry essentials. It's a limited time offer between the 21st of June and the 5th of July. Sponsors like Exeter help me keep on doing what I do here, so huge thanks to them for sponsoring today's video. Work continues at the launch site as SpaceX continues to make repairs and upgrades ahead of the second orbital launch. Crews were seen reinstalling the cryogenic flex lines for the booster quick disconnect on the launch mount on Tuesday morning. We also saw the relocation of some deluge piping sections. We saw lots of pipe works being moved around that will eventually all be installed and connected to create the manifold around the base of the launch mount. We also saw the arrival of some new prefabricated sections of a new staircase delivered to the orbital launch tower on Wednesday morning. 
Wednesday afternoon was definitely a weak highlight. The road was closed and we saw Ship 25 begin propellant loading. This was a re-attempt of a spin prime test that we saw a couple of weeks ago, which we suspect was abandoned or aborted for unknown reasons. Last week, however, was more successful and we saw SpaceX perform a successful spin prime test with Ship 25's engines following cryoload, bringing us one step closer to the vehicle's static fire campaign. Down at the build site, concrete placement for the ground floor of the new Star Factory building continued as a concrete pump truck was spotted on site. We also saw the rather careful and methodical disassembly of the ground fabrication building, including the removal of a large door. This rather careful approach, in contrast to the destructive demolition of the other buildings that we've seen, may suggest that this building is simply being relocated rather than completely removed. Simultaneously, construction of the new high bay advanced as more sections arrived for integration. As for vehicle progress, we saw Booster 12's methane tank lifted and stacked into its final section, meaning that both the methane and oxygen tanks are now complete and that we may see another fully stacked booster in the very near future. Speaking of full stacked super heavies, we saw the rollout of Booster 11 towards the end of last week, on its way to the rocket garden. As for the Starship upper stages, we saw the lifting and installation of Ship 28's second aft flap in the high bay on Thursday, bringing it very close towards completion. While SpaceX continues to diligently develop its next generation Starship launch vehicle, we still have the old reliable Falcon series to keep us entertained. We saw two launches from this vehicle last week, both of them Starlink missions. The first was on Thursday and was mission Starlink Group 5-7. The Falcon 9 launched from Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. It carried 47 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. After stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage performed its boost back burn before gliding down and then successfully landing on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship stationed in the Pacific Ocean. The first stage involved in this mission, designated as B-1075, is one of SpaceX's newer boosters. It has previously supported the SDA Tranche Zero mission, as well as two Starlink missions. The other Starlink launch we saw last week took place the next day, on Friday, when a Falcon 9 lifted off from Cape Canaveral carrying 56 Starlink satellites on Starlink Mission Group 5-12. Following stage separation, the first stage landed on the Just to Read the Instructions drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. The particular booster for this flight had a few more flights under its belt than the previous launch vehicle we saw last week. This first stage was B-1069, which has previously supported seven missions. CRS-24, Utilsat Hotbird 13F, OneWeb 15, SES-18 and 19, and three Starlink missions. Now, one of my favourite rockets ever, the Delta IV Heavy, is nearing the end of its operational life. Last week it launched for the second to last time, last week on Thursday, carrying a classified payload for the National Reconnaissance Office, a United States government agency responsible for developing and operating intelligent satellites. The satellite is therefore highly classified, but seeing that it required the massive power of the Delta IV Heavy, we can assume it was a fairly beefy payload, and United Launch Alliance confirmed that it was headed to a geostationary transfer orbit, which is the typical destination for Delta IV Heavies launched from Cape Canaveral, which is where this rocket launched from, after briefly setting fire to itself in true metal fashion. Now this is normal for the Delta IV. It's powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, but the hydrogen valves open first and for a brief moment before liftoff, hydrogen flows out of the engines before rising up the side of the rocket because it's lighter than air. As the flow of oxygen commences, the hydrogen is ignited, giving rise to the fiery spectacle that scolds the orange foam exterior of the Delta IV Heavy rocket, though the rocket is of course designed to withstand this. Over in China, last week on Tuesday, a Long March 6 launch vehicle successfully launched from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center located in Shanxi Province, northern China. The Long March 6 is a two-stage solid-fueled rocket primarily designed for the delivery of small satellites into orbit. During the launch last week, the Long March 6 successfully deployed the Cheyenne 25 satellite to low Earth orbit. This satellite, according to official sources, has entered its desired orbit and will play a crucial role in the fields of land census, urban planning and disaster prevention and mitigation. 
Last week on Thursday, NASA accomplished a significant milestone as they successfully completed the final hot fire in their initial certification tests. This series of tests, consisting of 12 separate hot fires, aims to lay the groundwork for the production of a new upgraded RS-25 engine that will be instrumental in propelling the SLS rocket during upcoming Artemis missions to the moon, starting with Artemis V. Last week, the test engineers, working in collaboration with Aerojet Rocketdyne, the leading contractor for the SLS engines, executed a comprehensive assessment that lasted over 8 minutes, or to be precise, 500 seconds, on an RS-25 certification engine. This test duration mirrors the time required to launch the SLS rocket and deploy the Orion spacecraft with astronauts on board into orbit. The testing once again took place at the Fred Hayes test stand located at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. It marked the 12th and final test in the current series, showcasing a certification engine that incorporates numerous enhancements to enhance production efficiency and affordability while upholding superior performance and reliability. With this stage accomplished, plans are now in place to conduct a subsequent hot fire series using a second certification engine later this autumn. We have some news from the Bepi Colombo mission. For those that don't know, Bepi Colombo is a joint mission by the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency aimed at studying the planet Mercury. Launched in 2018, the mission consists of two spacecraft, the Mercury Planet Orbiter, MPO, and the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter, MMO. The MPO will investigate Mercury's surface, interior, and exosphere, while the MMO focuses on studying its magnetosphere. By examining Mercury's composition, geology, atmosphere, and magnetic field, the mission seeks to enhance our understanding of the planet's formation and evolution. Bepi Colombo is following a complex trajectory, utilizing multiple flybys of Earth, Venus, and Mercury to gradually slow down and enter orbit around Mercury. The spacecraft is expected to arrive in 2025, conducting a one-year mission to gather valuable data about this enigmatic inner planet. And the big update from last week was that the spacecraft had made its sixth of nine planetary flybys, and the third flyby of the planet Mercury. Check out this video of the flyby, which is composed of 217 images captured by Bepi Colombo's monitoring camera. The planet's illuminated side quickly appears in the spacecraft's field of view, showing off a host of geological features on its surface. Now check these photos out. The Ariane 6 is on the launch pad. The Ariane 6 is a new European rocket aimed to be a cost-effective and versatile heavy lift vehicle to replace the Ariane 5. The Ariane 6 rocket seen in these images is not actually meant for spaceflight. Its purpose is to undergo thorough checks of assembly procedures, electrical and fuel connections, telemetry, and more. The actual flight models, including the rockets designated for the inaugural launch of Ariane 6, are being constructed in Europe and integrated by the main contractor, Ariane Group. Once completed, these models will be shipped to the French Guiana, where the core and upper stages of Ariane 6 are horizontally assembled. Later, they're transferred to the launch pad and carefully raised into an upright position inside the gantry, where the solid fuel boosters and payload are attached. This horizontal assembly approach significantly reduces the time and cost involved in preparing for a launch, marking a notable first for an Ariane rocket. As for the Ariane 5, its final flight is very soon, scheduled for the 4th of July. Keep your eyes peeled for that one. It has been quite a week on the International Space Station, with yet another spacewalk completed in a short span of 14 days. On Thursday, Roscosmos cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Petalin ventured outside of the station for their spacewalk. Their tasks involved retrieving experiment packages from the Poisk airlock and installing communications equipment. This spacewalk marked Prokopiev's seventh spacewalk and Petalin's fifth contributing to the impressive total of 266 spacewalks carried out for station maintenance and upgrades. In other news, the final addition to the SpaceX Crew-7 has been announced. Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov will serve as a mission specialist, joining the previously introduced crew members, including NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbeli, ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen, and astronaut Satoshi Furukawa from JAXA. The crew is set to embark on their journey to the space station in mid-August, launching from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Looking ahead, the upcoming conclusion of the 28th SpaceX commercial resupply mission promises to bring back more than 1.5 metric tons of cargo to Earth. One notable item among the cargo is a special chair utilized in European Space Agency studies named GRIP and GRASP. These studies delve into the effects of microgravity on astronauts' brain activity and GRIP strength over an extended duration. 
The valuable insights gained from this research will aid scientists in better understanding the potential hazards faced by astronauts when transitioning between gravity environments, such as landing on Mars after an extensive space voyage. I'd now like to thank the list of people scrolling on the left of the screen. That's right there, my Patreon members and my YouTube channel members, and it's their kind support that allows me to keep on making this content for you all. If you want to see your name listed there, then you know how. Just follow the links down below, and of course, while you're down there, just a little, little like on the video if you enjoyed the journey. And that's about all I have to say for this video. So uh, thank you, Exeter, for sponsoring, and thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.